Not sure. Good afternoon, everyone. If I've not yet met you, I'm Penny Miller Nelson. I serve as one of the associate superintendents here in the district, and I'm happy to be with you today. As you just heard, he's going to sit over here and uh, keep his germs to himself for a bit. Uh, DeAndre and I are really happy to be with you today to share an update about the status of our work in relation to the equity audit and the strategy overall for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, the next slide is my favorite. It's our vision <laughs> statement. So when we get that, I'll just invite you to take a minute and read that vision statement. This has been our vision statement for a couple of years now. Thank you. I'll give you a moment to read that. We'll stay grounded in this statement today as we share our update. We are really working intentionally to lead with respect, trust, and courage. Ensure that we are creating and maintaining an equitable, collaborative, and inclusive culture that enable all to And all for us really is all. It's every child. And ensuring that each student in our, in our school system, in our district, receives the student supports that they need to be successful. And so that is a big definition of what equity is. It's ensuring that each child has what they need to be successful. I'll remind you, uh, if you've been with us in the district since our equity audit, five domains that organize our work. You might remember that we partnered with Insight Education, a national organization that has experience in educational equity audits as a 30 independent organization to lead us through that process. That process was pretty extensive. Uh, it took us uh, more than a year to unearth all of the information, the data, to conduct the folk groups and survey and that resulted So these five domains of systems uh, really represent how we function how we organize ourselves to the services that we deliver to families. Uh, culture and community, rather, is just as it describes. It's keeping nothing in our culture. It's ensuring that it's collaborative, equitable, inclusive. Uh, equity, racial equity is a catered area. Uh, our data was very clear that that is a place that we need to do some work. Professional learning, personal uh, you might provide professionals to all staff, teachers most extensive administrators receive professional learning through the district. Being to grow our knowledge and skill in this area is important. And finally, curriculum, instruction, and learning. What happens in the classroom, how we organize that curriculum experience, and what the learner uh, experience looks like for the, if you will, that uh, equity audit really dug into and the recommendations uh, align to those areas. This is not the fullness of that. I invite you to go to our website. The equity audit report remains on the website uh, since we shared that with the <coughs> Board of Education. Today, our update, uh, as DeAndre will guide us through it, we're going to look, again, framing in those five domains, we're gonna look at just a snapshot of these recommendations. There were many, many recommendations and we are continuing to sort of sift through those and identify what the actions will be. These are the ones that we have action underway and we wanna share with you the good work that's happening in support of our teachers and students. So we will touch on um, some work that we're doing to ensure equitable opportunities, access and outcomes. We're gonna look at the team structure that DeAndre has helped create with our culture and climate leaders. We're going to look at um, how we're organizing that professional learning for teachers and for administrators, and then talk about some of the shifts that we're making in terms of our multi-tiered system of support and building those structures in ways that students don't fall through the cracks and we're ensuring their success. DeAndre, I believe you've all met him, is with us today. He is our Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. He's going to lead us through the rest of the slides, um, and then we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers. Thank you, Penny. Um, as Cher, I don't think I've met all of you, but again, I'm DeAndre Hogan. Um, 
the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, for Millen Public Schools. And in collaboration with Penny, other social superintendents, uh, Mr. Cheryl, um, we've kind of just been walking through this journey, figuring out, um, looking at our district, uh, reflecting, um, trying to notice and lift up any gaps in any aspect of our uh, district and operations that are um, here, and just looking at ways we can do better, and again, to serve each student, serve each family um, we have within our walls, and make sure that every student has opportunity to be successful, no matter what um, their background, no matter what how they show up uh, into our schools. And I'll flash this back up real quick. So as we go, um, we're going to go through each and touch on items that we have made progress on, that we're working on. And you'll, you'll, they'll be indicated by the kind of the symbols you see on the graphics there. Uh, it'll be in the corner or at the bottom of the page so you can kind of see which one correlates uh, which, which, with which domain that we're working on. So just, um, again, those same five domains, just in a different graphic, um, just helping to illustrate um, you know, through our system, through our structure, uh, what the opportunities we have to, again, ensure that each student has uh, equitable access um, to our resources, to our um, services, and that how making sure we ensure that access will lead to more equal outcomes. And again, really, um, as we think about educational equity, um, I would like to frame for you that uh, when it comes to educational equity, we are looking at, um, uh, in terms of educational equity, uh, it is about not letting the background, the demographics, or what zip code a student comes from, not allowing that to be a determinant factor for the success is kind of what I would like to put into your mind. We touched on the equity audit and the uh, domains within that. Wanted to share with you uh, about a bit of a process that we are using. Um, so the district participated and uh, several districts participated in a 10 month long cohort supported by uh, the Michigan Association of School Administrators, All right? Yep, um, always forget, get the abbreviation mixed up. Um, but they uh, put us through a cohort with uh, districts from across the state. Um, I think in this particular cohort featured 30 to 40 um, school districts that we can partner with, got to engage with, share notes, um, with about some of the work and happenings going on within our districts. Um, it stands for the Education Assessment and Transition Tool. And what this is, is, a, is just that, a tool to assess, take a dive and of the function of our, our district. And within the process, so um, opportunity to collaborate and plan. So a, bit, a little bit of a needs assessment, again, calling out, out the gaps and, and opportunities that we have in our district and then collaboratively working together working with administrators on figuring out solutions to make this a better environment and everything through this. Uh, here in the uh, bottom left corner, resources and again this is kind of through we're going to touch of the domains. Uh, highlight a uh, recognition, and then the next following slide will uh, feature work and some progress that we've made. So first uh, is structures, six systems and resources. Uh, recommendation here was to develop a district equity team to serve in an advisory capacity to ensure equitable practices are enacted in the district. And what we've done with this um, so far is establish culture and climate leaders. Uh, culture and climate leaders are educators, they're teachers. Um, when I put the call out or put the invitation out to teachers to join this team, I ask for teachers that are passionate, curious, have good rapport with their staff, um, have a good relationship with their principal, and are passionate and curious to learn more about um, some equitable practices and what we can do um, on, on an individual basis and as well as across the district. Um, so. The culture and climate leaders right now, their main function is to help support our professional development. And we'll touch on that a little bit um, later. So they ensure that we have consistent um, uh, training and conversations are going on throughout the district. Uh, as much as I would love to be everywhere um, all at once, um, you know, as, as much as my uh, son thinks I'm Superman, you know, it's not very uh, possible. So the culture and climate leaders, um, are really an extension of myself and the work we're doing 
And again, so I work with them collaboratively. Um, we have discussions, we engage in development ourselves, and then we kind of go out and share that uh, development and some of those tools with our buildings. And so, especially on PD days, it's really showing up. They're able to facilitate and run their own uh, DEI uh, during the professional development. And you see boots on the ground, that's what I really see them as, as, as a conduit between what's going on in their buildings and go you know, back up to me and vice versa. It's kind of a, uh, some information loops going on uh, back and forth between us to make sure I maintain a pulse of what's happening and so that they kind of understand where we are in our process at as, as the district level. Uh, so second domain, culture and community, uh, where we encourage to enlist in school community to work toward establishing a uh, supportive community focus on equitable outcomes and inclusivity. And uh, I think great opportunity to kind of just highlight the efforts from our um, student body um, here, uh, mainly at the secondary and as well as some community collaborations. So um, we, within this domain, we really um, think about the voices, right? We wanna hear, listen, and lift up uh, voices that includes our students students have um, direction and support from educators and um, you know, staff here. They have really been encouraged to organize and develop ways to lift up their concerns, things they're seeing, and communicate that with us in a you know, uh, uniform, consistent manner. And that, uh, as you see listed, there's um, certain groups that have been established at the high schools and secondary. Um, there's even a student diversity board at um, Dow High School, which has representation from each and every culture club that is at the schools. So any student group um, that is supported and functions at, at Dow High, there's representation at the student diversity board. Again, to offer that collaboration, hear what's going on, um, and opportunities for students to share with, you know, with their experience across, you know, with, with students not necessarily interact with. So. Great collaborative effort um, by our staff there at Dow High. Um, and looking at our community partnerships and collaboration, uh, have a great relationship with the Midland County Inclusion Alliance, uh, especially their parent engagement committee, as you see on the Chromebooks that are um, on the kids' stickers. Um, that is a big project coming from there. And that effort um, uh, you know, you know, has been great in the, the, the last iteration was a was came up come up with students the whole design was came up by some of our at the, at the time were fourth grade students um you know they were asked what is your take on um allyship or community or inclusion and what we see on the chromebooks is kind of what they had came up with so this is the ability to show us some of the um, work that our students do and engage in um dow uh, huge huge support of the efforts um they provide us with a grant for the cost of the equity audit, uh, also grants for staff development. And again, um, we have a communication with them and they help support um, and offer guidance for our efforts moving forward. Then the Midland Area Community Foundation, uh, their group that they support, the Cultural Awareness Coalition, um, group of volunteers that um, come and you know, you know, raise issues and, and, and raise awareness about you know uh, differences and they engage in a lot of community interaction a lot of volunteerism um, they support like lunar new year if anybody attended that at uh, dow diamond those are big uh, supporters of that came from cultural awareness coalition so their aim and effort is to bring education and awareness about the rich diversity that is here in midland that we might not always uh, consider and they also engage in which i've been a part of uh, community conversations this is an effort to provide that support, education, and learning and reflection for our organizations in town. So our nonprofits, our um, for-profit organizations, they, I think this, they're about to start their third cohort um, of engaging in these learning sessions. And we've been um, very fortunate to be a part of that. Now, still with culture and community, um, and I'll back up a little bit and I'll mention the, the EJAT. Um, that is something for as a tool for us to utilize as a district. And we're ensuring that, again, we have voice, we have participation from our stakeholders, uh, mainly our teachers. So we were um, able to, like with the help of our collaboration from our culture and climate leaders um, during our schedule professional development, uh, we use this portion of the EJAT, which is images, celebrations, and events to um, 
asks our teachers to kind of analyze their learning environment. Um, it asks questions like, and it, it's an assessment or a survey. And so we ask our educators to assess their learning environments um, because the, the point behind this portion of the EJET is to, uh, at, at the second paragraph there about that there are messages sent every day about what we value, All right? So what, uh, what posters are we hanging up on the wall? What type of books do we have in our classroom library? Uh, what type of examples or um, cultures or what, what diversity is reflected within our curriculum? It asks our teachers to look at that. One, is it present? Two, is it accurate? And, or, or does it rely on you know, stereotypes or, or, or things like that? Is it you know, harmful? And um, kind of do our, does it reflect the diversity of the world? Uh, and that is part of the uh, So we are to take the uh, share the results and help us frame with a area vision to address you know that and it's not just image walls but also as you um are all of our events accessible like our sporting events any stakeholder, no matter ability, are they able to access that opportunity? Are our parent-teacher conferences, are our concerts um, accessible to everybody, no matter what their ability level is? Like, do our teachers support uh, community events, or do they support school events? It kind of asks our teachers to reflect on those items. And again, with those results, we're going to collaborate and come up with some um, goals and solutions to, again, better enrich um, or better celebrate the diversity and, and enrich our stakeholders. Uh, the third domain, racial equity in the educator workforce. Um, again, we are encouraged to develop a uh, talent management strategy, um, addressing recruitment retention and a development talent pipeline. Um, career, um, encourage career options and advancement through our system with the, through a lens of equity. And uh, here to highlight some of the work that's been done here. Um, after the, uh, the first time we shared the equity audit results, uh, we met with the Mu Alpha Omega, um, part of AK Alpha Kappa Alpha, Alpha Kappa, Kappa Alpha uh, Sorority Incorporated, uh, which is the, uh, a sorority, um, a black sorority that has a chapter here in Midland. Um, and they, uh, depending on the results, they came and offered to support us in our recruitment efforts uh, to help diversify our talent pool. Uh, and they're very clear, they um, know Midland is exceptional. And so their effort is to help uh, in, uh, diversify our talent pool with accessible um, talent and um, through the connections that they have through their network. Like the sorority fraternities um, throughout the country has a vast ne network of alumni, folks that still work in school, um, you know, colleges that um, they still have connections with or are engaged with. To, they offered that network to us to help us, again, uh, find talent and um, traditionally have looked. And um, again, they're very clear. They're not here to help us like hire people. They're just they're looking at these other places as well because there's talent and there's qualified teachers in these areas also. Uh, mostly in Brown, um, HBCUs um, throughout the country and these other universities that they've helped through their work. And they're, again, their volunteer, their passion have connected us and helping us foster new relationships with um, different personnel at these universities listed here. Um, and as well spurred us to um, participate, uh, NPS personnel to participate at the Howard University, or Howard University uh, later in the spring. Fourth domain, um, professional learning and growth. Um, again, from the audit, we're encouraged to develop and implement a plan across the district um, to consistently uh, implement professional learning uh, with a focus on cultural competence uh, for all staff, including uh, district members, which I'll touch on in a second. Um, and again, I mentioned the culture and climate leaders and the work that they help uh, you do. Again, provide that consistent uh, messaging, provide that consistent, um, those consistent conversations and resources throughout um, the district. They're an extension of uh, myself. And they are um, also engaging with me in a book study around a book, uh, Tangible Equity 
which um, is, again, uh, rooted in your know, solution base. There's a tons of, tool, tons of tools and resources in there. Um, like, for example, the last couple of meetings we've had with culture and climate leaders, we've been engaging in like root cause analysis. Um, so identifying the issue and getting to the bottom of why it is there. And then once we go through the whole process, we can come up with a better you know, viable solution to act upon it. And that's just, um, so even just beyond like DEI, that's a good practice too. And then to, uh, you know, take out in a, within their respective I got just the activities and the tools that we're uh, utilizing. That's more. So that they come up with two ways, two, two, reasons, two reasons made it better. And they kind of shift in our thinking, getting us to uh, come up with some solutions. And again, so we're not running into the same issues. Uh, for sure. So not not to get specific, but in general, I um, think uh, we get as educators, there's always like kind of a new initiative that comes out you know, each uh, and every year. Like this is the thing, this is it, this is what we're going to do to make these changes. It usually fizzles out after a while. Um, and that's because, you know, whether it's various reasons, it's um, the rollout isn't as effective, not a lot of buy-in or um, you know, aren't able to keep up with like the energy that we started off. And so I talked about um, what we're doing kind of at the teacher, teaching staff level. Um, our, edu our administrators, our building principals and our administrators down here are also engaging in some um, developmental work as well using the uh, intercultural development continuum. So I was able to administer a survey, um, is the intercultural development inventory to assess our ability to, um, to assess our cultural competency. How well are we able to engage with um, folks uh, that are come from a different background than us is uh, what we assessed. And there's, as you see, this is a continuum. And I will say this continuum is fluid. So someone can you know, take the assessment here and end up in acceptance. They can take it another time and you'll be in polarization. It's very dependent upon uh, kind of what's going on in this person's, you know, life experiences. If there was like a drastic shift in something that occurred to them, like a change of job, something traumatic that could impact, um, you know, where they end up on the continuum. Um, and again, it's fluid, you know, judgment, judgment free. It's just kind of telling you, uh, given your experience and the skills you picked up along the way to wherever you're at, this is how, uh, this is the best interpretation that you engage with folks from different backgrounds than you. And we are um, you know, developing consistent uh, development in these areas. We're kind of working through each of these orientations, no matter where our folks fell, we kind of just, um, or end up on the continuum. And again, uh, relating that to how we engage with our families and students uh, at the school level. Then curriculum instruction and learning, a couple uh, uh, recommendations here is just to to expand our curriculum um, and instructional materials to prioritize inclusion and equity um, with alignment with our uh, teacher growth and evaluation rubric. Um, and two, establish a culture of developmental responsiveness, which ensures the uh, practices adults users can respond to individual, cultural, and developmental learning needs and strengths. So again, just kind of taking, um, um, meeting our students uh, where they are, um, you know, maintaining that is it uh, low floor, high ceiling, maintaining our expectations, uh, high expectations, you no know, academic excellence, but providing the resources that a student can do on an individual basis. And here in this effort, we've uh, done great work in increasing the diversity of choice texts uh, for teachers and students. Again, just offering um, different authors, um, books with different uh, you know, main characters from you know, different backgrounds and experiences and um, just you know, kind of just in the uh, best diversity of the world. These are our ESS, our multi-tier system of with point two. Um, again, meeting students where they are, providing those resources necessary. 
this is a CSS a framework um, to ensure that all students have equitable achievement uh, or it can achieve our goals. Um, and based on the individual, this is what that student comes with. We are addressing that with interventions, with um, just to ensure, again, they can have an outcome. And there's also uh, some school success teams that um, um, colleague of great job established uh, the build, our building when uh, it's you know, noticeable uh, folks that that student may interact with. We surround that teacher with support to come up and collaborate with and then identify again, get to the root cause of what issues or concerns are, um, address them, and then that will lead to you know, comes in the classroom. And um, something that I like to use, or you know, this passion that I, I like to use that kind of helps me uh, ground um, this work and our effort um, going ahead is DEI's conversation. I know we hear DEI, we hear diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, and we, you know, it's, we attach it and we socialize it with other bunch of other items and things. But uh, here, I think this helps just to illustrate. Um, the, the purpose and the uses and the a little bit of, the, of defining what these words mean. So I'll read it aloud. Um, whereas diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice ask. Diversity asks who's in the room. Equity responds who is trying to get in the room but can't. Whose presence in the room is under constant threat of erasure. Inclusion asks, has everyone's ideas been heard? Justice responds, whose ideas won't be taken as seriously because they aren't in the majority. Diversity asks, how many more of any marginalized group do we have this year than last? Equity responds, what conditions have we created that maintain certain groups as the perpetual majority here? Inclusion asks, is this environment safe for everyone to feel like they belong? Justice challenges, whose safety is being sacrificed and minimized to allow others to be comfortable maintaining the humanizing views? And yeah, I really like this piece because I feel like it helps kind of ground, kind of give some form or definition to the buzzwords that we are hearing out there and uh, really has a lot to do with what is driving us um, as a district. And like for anybody that is, you know, I encourage anybody that's curious in, you know, DEI work, um, making sure that they're not, um, you know, themselves on an individual basis upholding any um, you know, dehumanizing views, actions or disparaging treatment of others, I encourage you all to start here. Just that simple question, who's in the room? If you're at a, you're at a, you're at a table, you're at a place that uh, you're making decisions that have to do with other people, ask who's in the room. If the people you're talking about aren't at the table with you, it's probably not gonna have a great uh, result or it's not gonna work out like you intended it to do But because you need those voices and that's kind of what we're, part of what we're doing here. Um, so I really love and super encouraged by our students that uh, have engaged in these, they are finding their voice, um, kind of figuring out, um, you know, how to, you know, come together and reach out to their peers and, you know, work together, come up with some solutions and then share them uh, with us and work with us with our uh, support. And again, to make their experience the best that we uh, possibly can. So looking ahead, uh, kind of the rundown, of what I gave with the EJET, uh, in that first portion, images, celebrations, and events, that was very, um, felt that was very kind of, you know, low risk, uh, very um, accessible to any of our educators, no matter where they're at um, in this space, to just, hey, look around at your class, evaluate, um, you know, the images that you see, right? Um, as a very like, low risk system, that helps us um, and other areas uh, throughout our district, such as discipline, uh, resource allocation, so where, are, where do we, you know, send the most funds? Is that in an equitable way, equitable manner? Is our processes and practices, um, you know, through an equity lens? Uh, professional learning and growth, continue to evaluate uh, uh, curriculum instruction and learning, and as well as We've made progress more uh, in these areas. And again, all in, the, all in the effort to live out our MPS vision statement, 
Yeah. Lead with respect, trust, and courage. Ensure an equitable, collaborative, and inclusive culture, enabling all to achieve success. So, thank you. And any questions now? Uh, education, justice, assessment, and transformation tool. Oh, that's a lot. Um, I think it comes from perception. Uh, it comes from, so we have metrics, and if you know, certain metrics um, aren't being met, if you know, in with staff after they receive a training, uh, how's the implementation going? If it's not meeting those marks, then, um, and I, I probably oversimplify, we'll call it a failed initiative, but um, if um, Teague as well, like if our, our educators that we're trying to you know, work with are, Solutions aren't being met. May or may not be a good thing, but since this program has been implemented, I feel like the tensions have been worse. We've actually separate, excuse me, separated into safe spaces for different races, different genders, different ideologies. Now, what what we we should have more goals that are that bring us together. And at the end of that, that transition thing that you were showing, we do come together, which which is awesome. We we, should, we need to be there. I'm just worried that. You know, maybe are we going the wrong direction, and how do we know we're going the wrong direction? I'm mm -hmm. just hoping that the leadership that may be bringing these programs to us can help us understand that before, before like, oh shoot, we got someplace. You know, this race fighting this race in our schools, and it's very clear to clearly defined. Whereas we had one or two off instances before, maybe a couple of troublemakers that could have been dealt with on an individual basis instead of a systemic basis of all students. So. That's what's really, it's not, it's not an easy answer. That's yeah. what's, I think, bugging on. So um, the concern is that we are kind of jumping the gun a little bit on, on some of the, uh, the DEI program or initiative and worried about um, us continuing to deepen the divide, yeah, 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 right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And I mean, we're going to have, we're going to have security systems put on our schools, we're going to have cameras looking at all of our kids' faces. We're going to have safe spaces for one group here, safe spaces for one group there. These people, according to some of the things you're saying here, aren't going to be able to deal with adversary. Ad, 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 you know, not, I'm not talking about between racial groups or sexes or anything like that. I'm just talking about dealing with character-building problems. Mm -hmm. so, so a lot of that, I think, is important about growing up. I just want to make sure that that's still there. Um, how do you deal with Things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so how to um, work on this stuff, but at the core, maintain uh, educating all of our students and coming out of you know MPS with knowledge to deal with diversity yeah. and coping. Um, so, okay. A situation students of two different races they say some very nasty it's not go to for suspension or whatever you know what I mean so I, I mean I've been called nasty names at the Midland Mall here and I didn't judge these people because they called me a racial slur mm -hmm. you know I, I kind of moved on I, I joked around with them a little bit I just want to make sure we're not Right. Yep. And, uh, I don't uh, personally. I don't uh, feel like his work is deepening those um, uh, divides, and I do. Uh, 
I make an effort to be out in the buildings every day because of what's going on. I actually engage in some restorative conversations with um, if there are, you know, some one on one with students. And I don't uh, think that we are engaged in this effort because of a few one-off instances. Um, but, and we're not just, you know, race. Um, build us, build us, the students uh, um, with you know, LGBTQ to have, um, and race as well. So it's yeah, and, absolutely. like this and, right? Agree on that. The letter that was signed by all the board members specifically calls out race. And that was. It calls out disability too. It says it, it has a list of disabilities in there. I mean, it just said it. We had it just called out. With IEPs. Very funny. Here. Um, I just want to also offer. I know you. Me and Sherry talked about our social emotional learning. And our mental health, you know, the classroom community is a lot of what you mentioned, engaging in that productive confrontation, conflict, your sort of figure out. I think Jeff's from a discipline uh, perspective, we use as learning experiences. And so I think when you use the space, I think we are trying to create spaces, opportunities for students to come together and feel that they have a place here at Midland Public Schools. You know, we have an obligation to ensure that every single student who comes to us feels that they belong. Right now, that might look like groups of students, as we had on our slide. Our end game is exactly what I think you said. All bring something really show you can school community uh, and we're going to get there but having groups that can convene and engage in community service with people that they connect with well um, to plan events that long and something that's important it's not exclusive so I, I have the same problem with SEL you're either 100% mm -hmm. sure the situation, so you send stuff back home. I mean, the parents and the they deal with these issues, and you, you have to incorporate something with, you know, diversity. I, I don't sure. Know mm -hmm. I, I, I want to just add those those groups are not exclusive. Uh, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Anyone right. can join right. those. And they're about, and so and I think what we're hitting at, or what I would like to point out, is um, the use and purpose of like an affinity group. Um, affinity groups are there to. Um, in a way, that's what kind of our groups are, is to serve as folks come together with like experiences. There is support. There's just natural camaraderie uh, with that, and they learn from each other. Uh, is like one aspect in the, in the groups that you saw listed. Um, in part, do that, but in part, engage in outreach. So they, as Penny shared, they're not exclusive. One, they serve as a, that safe space for like experiences to come together. Uh, with each other, acknowledge, um, and you'll know, lift each other up. And at this, uh, another purpose is to educate peers, bring peers and people engage in that outreach to share their experiences with others and provide that courage or space for you know, others to engage in that same thing, so they can kind of, so they can also come to school um, and be their you know full selves, no matter. Standard. We had right we now. had some additional. Um, we had some additional folks over here, and then we'll come back to you if we if we get. Um, we, I was, I had a question about some of your early savings, but they kind of got answered. Good. But I, I wanted to just say, like, it kind of makes, I think it makes more sense if we, when we're thinking about diversity and inclusion, as like we're not trying to get to say everybody's the same, right? It's right. where we get to. Yes. Mm -hmm. So then that, I think, is from that context, then that, that's kind of where it fits. And I just had two questions. Like, one was regarding, like, the diversity of staff. Mm -hmm. I was excited to hear you say that you're, like, reaching out to improve the diversity of the staff mm -hmm. because I think that there's um, a lot of, like, 
free benefits for all yeah. of our students, right? To mm -hmm. be able to have that leadership and yeah. see it. Um, and I was just wondering if there was any discussion about, um, like, if we're able to diversify our staff, how can we retain the diversity mm -hmm. of staff? And do we, are we thinking about, like, what things can we keep put in place that, like, um, whether it's gender or race, like, if you're, I mean, I work in automotive for 20 years, so mm -hmm. I'm, like, you know, the one woman in the room. So, like, what can we do that makes them we plan ahead so that once we get them here, yeah. <laughs> they want to stay here and they don't feel like they're the only one in the room. And then the question was just like, how can we help? Um, thank you. I'll try to touch on the first one because that, you know, it's a big conversation I'm, I'm having with our HR that we are having engaging with the HR team. Um, you know, we don't just want to bring folks here to you know, just tokenize them, right? We want to make sure they enter into a space where they can you know, bring their full self, bring their experience um as a as a you know teacher or staff or uh, what have you and that takes co continued collaboration with uh, our community partners um like the Midland business alliance are engaged in you know just the kind of great lakes bay region like it's we want uh talent here like the census said everybody's going to west michigan within the next 10 years so it's like a whole like region conversation that uh, we're having and engaging in to ensure that great lakes bay region is a viable um good solid place for folks to move into. And again, just, I know it's not going to answer specifically, but it is a conversation that we're having with our, our, our friends and organizations in the region. Um, and as far as um, our and NPS with our HR staff, it's like kind of an EJET process, like some, um, some inspiration and some um, you know, quality resources and tools that we can establish here. or uh, short sessions once a month after school and those new teachers are invited to join. We compensate them for their time. Our curriculum team has put together this series where getting more information about what they need to do to be successful, but they're also really bonding as a group and feeling of belonging as part of our staff. And I know that you are hard to make sure that our new teachers are welcome sort of bring them into the fold as well. So it's it's looking if they feel they belong and that they're valued and they have the support and resources they need. The second part of your question, I think we... Well, I, I mean, I'd like to add to a lot of conversations around even topics. Not, not, not just the topic of race, but even around gender. You know, but we've also had conversations about things like housing, you know, the headlines and yes we're a partner with the city and the foundation with our east lawn property and do we think it's a good thing well that's housing that young teachers will stay here and can afford to be in and so all those pieces fit in in a sense of belonging as all of us come i came to this community 10 years ago and it took a while to feel acclimated and belonging in the community and that's the same for people right? those pieces of it as well and so um and then education sadly it's become a driven workforce and so we also have to work hard on our now elders going in and stay into it any males get into the depression and are leaving to do as well so there's a lot of pieces in that part of it oh just engaging in conversations uh such as this um uh, I'm also as part of the strategy we're working on different apps my parent um, voice so that um, I can you know, seek input I would like from all structure like that um, you know right now to provide uh, to parents to get the constant in a structured way um, um, you know communication and now um, I have parents, you know, reaching out to me uh, when it happens, come up. Um, that's been kind of a good way to keep up to what's uh, going, what concerns are. Uh, but more to come um, on that for sure. But thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of piggybacking off of that, I've heard you said coming to things like this is good. Um, me personally, I have instead of more big picture thing, which is kind of 
here, I have a lot of smaller and different ideas. Okay. So back on history, I went and moved back. I have worked in schools for my entire life. Mm -hmm. I've been in middle schools. I've also been in other schools that are much more diverse than middle schools. How, as a case member, as anything, physically have a conversation about things to enact, not just big picture, but like on the ground. For example, I was president of PTO at my former school. Mm -hmm. Some things that we enacted are a representative from each board meeting of it for a few minutes and talk about how they were specifically including um, diversity equity in their buildings. Like, did this is for social engineering on people? So, give me a break. Okay, you can have a turn. Okay. Let's shut it. That's that's. It's, we're going to stay productive today, guys. I, you know, some of DeAndre's presentation today, but everyone having a, an inclusion in here. Let's be respectful of them. Please. Some of the things that we did as a PTO would talk about a large portion of students who celebrated Ramadan. And mm -hmm. so we would talk about should we have this event that evening or should we you know, be yeah. more inclusive and have a different evening. So we would report about different things like that. Um, where is an opportunity where we can talk about things of that nature or um, finding best practices from other districts that have worked, that have been inclusive of people? How can we actually have those in detail discussions? Kind of uh, have that dialogue and you know, share different ideas. Um, John, let me jump in just a second. So that was the, very much the concept of PIC. And so PIC's been around a long time in the district. And at one time, it was uh, representatives from each PTO in the buildings to come to the PIC. It failed. We weren't getting them. We had very small audiences. And so I opened it during my time to everyone, anyone in the community. But I think the way to get that. Um, I think. Yep, yep. And when, I think when you mention a school board meeting, um, many people have the perception of what the public school board meeting is. is. And, and we have board subcommittees where parents could meet on DEI and, and committee structures. So we use a committee structure. Public board meetings are actually just open to the public and it's the board's meeting to conduct their business that night. That's all it's supposed to be. And so if you're trying to do a, a business meeting and then also do a public engagement meeting, you're gonna have some problems on that. And so that's, and I know that people don't fully understand that component of it. So hence why we do subcommittees, we do of parent committee structures. Penny does school improvement uh, structures. DeAndre does, uh, has had um, a parent committee for our, our DI structure as well. So um, I think that's the process that you're looking for. So how do you get to the subcommittee? Yep. And that's definitely on me. Um, we did have a parent advisory uh, committee. It was, was established during um, the peak of COVID. And so it was Virtual, everybody was, everyone was much more available. It kind of turned into, once lives got to some sort of regularity, um, the availability of all the participants were able to make it. So I kind of put a pause on it right now. And again, as I mentioned with like the affinity group structure, trying to navigate some ways that, um, that we can come up with a schedule that more voices can come to um, and um, kind of provide that structure again. The kind of group. So we're revisiting that right now and more to come. Um, and I think you know, through our communication channels, like the communique, um, letters, your principals in your buildings, we'll kind of throw that invitation out on there to link to sign up to receive regular updates, especially regarding uh, DEI. And I, and I think, Penny, Greg, Greg we're on some of your questions in a roundabout way it comes to school improvement committees too. Mm -hmm. And so uh, school improvements, yes, I might act in a portion of it, but it's also about community and culture, all those pieces that grow into that. And so each building has school improvement committees, a district school improvement committee structure that goes into our school improvement plans. And I think that's kind of what you're trying to get to. It's on that too. So yeah, uh, we can talk, we can, I'll connect with you after on school improvement. Great. That's all. <clears throat> Gentlemen in the back, the sunglasses.
Um, so throughout, great question. Um, Repeat the question for everyone here. Yep. Uh, so at, the question was, how do we determine um, what is a diverse or what um, way are we determining what are the metrics to determine um, you know, diverse images in the classroom? And in the EJAP process, it uh, specifically spells out um, specific backgrounds and like racial makeups, identities. Um, throughout, we ask image about this group. And if the like, uh, uh, rating um, that you see it a lot is either you see it all the time, you see it infrequently, or you don't see it at all. It's kind of just the gist of um, the ranking there. And Identity group that's not, they will you know, mark the one zero. If they use identity group that is shown, they will indicate, like, yes, like, see it frequently. Um, and that, Um, so decide with identity, um, and that is through ratio. So the process is ready to assess, um, look at results, collaborate with our teachers, allow our teachers um, what change in their in their buildings and in collaboration with their principal, and then that would be to assess like, and that we see improvement from the data. If not, then we're also getting this of just reflecting, evaluating, seeing where we're at. Not not this and one of the jet the equity audit process again as a in one of the um, later slides it's kind of what's next we're also going to look at uh, discipline practices you know take a deep dive into our um, curriculum and in, in especially our MTSS framework as well are we meeting the needs of all of our students to ensure um, they're you know reaching and you know, attaining academic excellence here can I just to the uh, images, celebrations, events uh, category of that work is really about establishing an environment again. And there is a lot of research, Amanda has presented at the previous PIC meeting, that until students can really feel safe and that they belong at school and in their classroom, their brain can't even be ready to learn. So while it seems maybe like a low level target for us. It is the first part of making sure our environment is safe and inclusive so that every student can be ready to learn. Today, I also just want to frame, these are snapshots of pieces we're doing. There is some really intense work happening with our multi-tiered system of support in identifying students who are not being successful, drilling down using data to identify academic interventions that they need in order to level up. So we're not pressing on those areas too. And suddenly feeling like all that's happening is that we're focusing on images, celebrations, and events. It's, it's academic as well. Uh, well, dramatic is relative, um, but yes, I think the combination of all of these things is with the intention of, of leveling students up academically. It's why we're here. All the pieces that we're putting in place of this puzzle are to support student growth, learning, and academic achievement. Yep. Um, what kind of data do you use the phrase several times, equitable outcome, and you just kind of use a similar phrase right there. How do you define equitable outcome to students in, a, in an educational environment when you've got a vast array of 
capabilities, kids being so different with many different gifts. What what is an equitable outcome and how do you measure that? I love that you recognize all of our students have their special gifts and talents. We, although it didn't shine through today, maybe in our dialogue, we really are working on being more asset based. Uh, certainly, we have to recognize where students have some deficits and some needed areas of growth, but really leveraging their strengths, their gifts, their talents, because uh, that's, again, part of making them feel that they belong here and can see success and reach their potential. So on the academic front, the Michigan Department of Education, our legislators have defined for us what that outcome is, right? To reach proficiency uh, in the core area subjects by the time they reach 11th grade and they need to be proficient in the content expectations of all of the courses that are required to receive a diploma uh, here in a Michigan school. So that's that's our charge if we just distill it down to that. No, and I love that. Obviously, I believe that's what all of our mm -hmm. athletics mm -hmm. school, right? So that they're learning and they're achieving. Um, it, it's the it's the equity piece of the DEI that I'm trying to understand what okay like kids aren't the same so they right. will never have the three so they're very very different each and every one of them and different gifts and different challenges mm -hmm. um, there's no way I could expect them all to achieve an equitable outcome because they never would I'd have to either make this one give up that gift and, and try to take on that one's challenge. So again, that, I'm just trying to understand because that is a significant part and it's a phrase that you used and it is the one measurable that I can see mm -hmm. um, in the whole program. So what, so simplifying it, you're saying everyone's proficient. Oh, as a baseline, that, I mean, chime, chime in, Mr. Yeah, Cheryl. I'm looking, but I have as a, a hard baseline, time not, that, if you know my <laughs> personality. So, so, um, a couple things you said I really like because, and not picking, but don't take it wrong. I heard earlier the BS doesn't have diversity, and I might have been the first one in a long time that because we never had our because we you send us so many wonderful kids who achieve so high that we never looked at our subgroups of kids who didn't achieve high. And my entire career, mine in PS was probably predominant with. Um, students on the other end, end of the level, special needs, low socioeconomic status, um, rough neighborhoods, and all those components of it. And so when we looked at our years ago, and we still look at our scores, we're top, whatever, top 10% performing school district, all those labels that we have, we're a high performing school district, but there's a subgroups in our, in our population who do not achieve well. And I said that when I got here, and probably some people went, my can't believe it. And it can be anything I want to say. We do really well. Send us your really high achieving kids. But if you're low achieving, we don't pay attention to them a lot. Well, I can tell you we now do. And it's looking at that data. And, how, and so when you talk about equity, it's growth. If every single kid is capable of growing a full academic year, now we have to do it different for every one of them, though. We need to rest. So if you're running an at-risk school, Central Park is, is labeled our at-risk school by the poverty level there. Um, I think it's powerful that staff says all kids can get there. We just got to do it differently than other schools do. And we got to do it in a different way in order to get them all there. Because we all, and you said you had three, that all learn differently. And that is absolutely correct. And so we have to, to me, equity means we can all come there. For some, it's going to take... 14 years for some it could take nine years um, some is going to take summer school some is going to take different strategies and techniques um, into doing that and so we're becoming a better district um, at doing that but by the way we have to so when I arrived 10 years ago we had don't hold me the exact number 17 percent when it had a label of at risk money label but it's a label that's often used and today we're like at 36 37 percent and so our community changed in its diversity. Our special education population has grown. And so we have got to become a more strategic district in doing that. And so are we there? Mm -mm. Our whole state's not. You know, when you guys look at state data, and I've heard some of the negativity, you could almost pull NPS out of that. You know, our state data is middle of the pack or lower. NPS isn't middle of the pack or lower. 
But if we're going to be the state we want to be, we've got to get the at-risk groups performing higher. And it's easy for me to say, well, if we just fix Detroit, Flint, Benton Harbor, and sell, we'd be a better state. We, but make sure you understand that it's also rural northern Michigan, and it's also pockets in Midland that we have the exact same problem going on that you would in an inner city or a rural area. And those are tough conversations to have. Um, and I don't back away from tough conversations, so we pushed and we pushed, and I have my flaws, but that's one I keep pushing on and will for the remaining months that I have left work, and we've made great gains, so. Um, and I told myself some students who are falling through the cracks who could have used that hand up um, and totally have a heart for those kids. My question is, how does the DEI, you're assuming the DEI framework lifts those kids up that are the metric that just, that's just, the proficiency for the at-risk kids is the metric to say that DEI is successful in its implementation. And, and that's what I'm trying to get. What are we, yeah. what are no. we, how do we know or understand our success? And if it's specifically targeting at-risk and lifting kids at risk, like, Everything we can do to lift kids up, totally on board with that. How do we know that this focus is doing what needs to happen to lift those kids? How do we know that that's a success? I get defining yeah. success, defining equitable outcome. How do we measure that, I guess? So in a quick conversation, I would say you would have to combine MTSS. And if you missed that one, please go back and watch Amanda explain it the best she could on that, because it all goes hand in hand if we're going to get there. Um, and how, we, how do we measure that? We have more measurements than people would like, more than we would like anywhere. And, and, and honestly, we can break data. We have tools today that can break data in 100 million ways. And so we will measure student growth each year, student growth when they leave us, by, and then by subgroups across the world. And we all get caught up in subgroups. This is kind of our society today is racial. And that's where you might be accurate, saying that we don't have large subgroups in, as someone said that earlier, in MPS. Don't know, a center. Um, in many other ways as well, have subgroups from socioeconomic status to broken. Any of it. We put in, we're going to have to be careful measuring it. Yeah, shock. we've got education. We're, we, we've got into it's happened in the 10 years over here. We didn't do that. Day to get there where we educate all your friends. Really our goal. And meaning we're doing where all kids die. We're all comfortable. And we're we're through the summer. Play. It's high level as well. You know, I, it, I, I'm a worker. I believe that their friends are high risk aren't being challenged to move this fast. And so it's not just low-end kids. And so I've always had IB and AP, but somewhere in the elementary and middle school, we kind of weren't pushing the ball. And so there's a fine line of when you divide, how you do that. We all know that in education, you parents, I don't know that we did it perfect. We're still going to work at it. But we are, our goal, all levels, all kids, and it's growth for every time they get to the finish line. What happened during the pandemic? Did, did all schools lose growth? They did. By the way, ours was smaller than some. We were in school more often than other. We, we fought it well, I believe. Um, did we lose gains? Absolutely, we did. And so, hence, we were growing our summer school. Absolutely. By the way, it's the finish line. We hope to catch up with measure. And some of you now give you a assessment data and measure three times a year on that growth academic growth so could we pause since it's yeah. after one and folks who need to be on their way feel welcome to go and we'll shut the tape off and we'll stay and talk all yeah. you want yeah thanks for being here if you're leaving we appreciate okay. your time